Okay, so I'm going to be talking about foliations of domains in C2 the, uh, associated with uh, pluriharmonic functions. And this is joint work with Peter Papadopoul and Ralph Obersforth. The work is all fairly old, four or five years old, but fortunately this looks like an audience where I haven't told it to everybody before. So uh, there's a chance that there are some people who haven't heard this. <laughs> so the underlying observation is the most obvious thing in the world. If you have an open subset of CN and a pluriharmonic function on it, then that domain naturally comes with a foliation. I don't know how people like to think about it. The obvious way to say it is that if you have a pluriharmonic function, then it's locally the real part of an analytic function. And uh, you can look at the inverse images of points by this, by this complex analytic function, which will foliate the domain into sub analytic subvarieties of dimension n minus 1. Perhaps you prefer to think in terms of uh, subbundles of the tangent bundle. If so, you, should, you can look at the uh, kernel of the derivative of h, and then you can, uh, that is a real hyperplane, and every real hyperplane contains a unique complex hyperplane, and we are finding the condition that h be pluriharmonic is exactly the condition that that family of hyperplanes be integrable, that the Frobenius condition is satisfied, and that you can fit them together to be tangent to some family of n minus one dimensional complex manifolds. Now, the point about all this is that the real interest when you have a, a, harmonic, a pluriharmonic function is does there exist a harmonic conjugate? Is it in fact globally the real part of an analytic function or are there obstructions? And the obstructions to be ab a being able to choose a global uh, a global harmonic conjugate are exactly reflected in the complications of this foliation that leaves become dense or have some complicated closure. And this is a geometric way of describing the difficulty of choosing globally harmonic conjugates. So I am going to describe the foliations that occur in two, excuse me? Uh, in the case where the function g is not a submersion, when, the, when it's derivative, when, the, when it has critical points, then these critical points lead to singularities. In the specific cases, examples that I'm going to be talking about, as it turns out, they don't. But, uh, I mean, if in general there would be, c there would be singularities at the points where h, uh, at the critical points of h. So the two specific cases that I want to talk about are Henle mappings and polynomial mappings from Cn to Cn. Well, it's mainly going to be C2 to C2. And to each of these, there is a region with a pluriharmonic function defined on it by the dynamics. And in each case, trying to understand how the global structure of this foliation is quite an entertaining problem and the, the global structure is, is really, I think, quite pretty and uh, well worth examining. There are no doubt many other examples. Well, I haven't looked at them yet. So, the first case is Hinol mappings. So, a Hinol mapping is a map which is written in the form xy gives p of x minus ay x. And when a is not zero, this is an invertible mapping. Here is the formula for the inverse. There is a theorem of Friedland and Milner which guarantees that every polynomial automorphism of C2 is either a Hinol mapping or a composition of Hinol mappings or in some sense trivial in the sense that you can write it so that one variable depends only on itself so that you can split it as a parametrized family of one-dimensional mappings. So this is really the fundamental example of a polynomial automorphism of C2. The 
The dynamic objects in this subject are the sets k plus or minus of points with bounded forward and backwards orbits and uh, their intersections and so forth. In some sense, understanding a Hinault map is understanding the locus k is equal to k plus intersect k minus the set of points with bounded orbits in both directions. Uh, understanding Hinault mappings really means understanding k and we're a long ways away from uh, being in the situation where we do understand k in any substantial number of, k, of examples. Um, I will call u plus and minus the complements of k plus k to, and, and of k plus and k minus respectively. And somehow the first theorem in this subject says that the functions g plus or minus, g is, uh, is chosen in honor of green, the functions g plus or minus, now these are expressions which when you do dynamical systems you come to know really well. The reason for which this limit exists is that roughly, if you do the iteration one more time and divide by d one more time, you should essentially not change the situation. This means that the norm is blowing up essentially by being raised to the dth power at each stage. And so this limit is measuring how fast points are going to infinity either forwards or backwards depending on whether I put in a plus or a minus. And the theorem says this limit does exist. This idea that things go to infinity at most by having the norm raised, by, raised uh, to the dth is correct. They define continuous subharmo pluri subharmonic functions. This should be pluri, I'm in several dimensions. Pluri subharmonic functions on C2. And the interesting thing from the point of view of today's lecture is that they are pluri harmonic on u plus and minus respectively. So this locus u plus and minus are foliated. They come with the foliation associated to the pluriharmonic function g plus or minus. And one may wonder, what does this foliation look like? And I'm proposing to describe it to you in detail. Yes, you have? Uh, uh, for the following reason. Um, first, g plus of xy is equivalent to log x uh, as xy goes to infinity with um, y less than x. There's a first statement. As a result, if you plot absolute value of x here and absolute value of y here, uh, out here, it certainly is, it has no singularities uh, because log x, of course, has no singularities. But now any point which escapes will eventually enter this region. And since the Hinault map is invertible, you have a pullback by, a, by an invertible map of something without singularities. So, these u plus and minus are foliated by Riemann surfaces. And here are the claims. The leaves are isomorphic to C. Already a little surprising. After all, anybody who works with Riemann surfaces naturally expects any, Riemann sur any, any uh, general nondescript Riemann surface to be isomorphic to D. But this one isn't. Each is dense in the level set of its pluriharmonic function. And that level set is homeomorphic to a three-sphere with a solenoid removed. The, so here you have, inside this three-sphere, you have all these leaves, which are dense. They're piling up next to each other. There's a way of unfolding them all at once. It's not a difficult thing to, to construct. And if you do unfold them all at once, well, you get something 
which certainly ought to have C as one factor, and a base as the other factor, and the base is in fact C minus the closed unit disk. Now, that isn't quite enough. It's par perfectly possible to have a complex manifold whose fibers are all isomorphic to C and whose base is C minus D bar without its being a product. But in this case, it is a product. It is C minus D bar cross C. And so this set U plus is isomorphic to a quotient of C minus D bar cross C, which isn't quite a bounded domain, but still it's an interesting subset of C2 by a discrete subgroup of automorphisms. The discrete subgroup is isomorphic to the rational numbers with only powers of D in the denominator. Okay, so I think I'm now going to try to prove all of these results and show you wh how this foliation is designed, how you actually have this set U plus broken up into copies of C uh, which are all folded on top of each other. So actually the picture that I had started drawing here is the right one. Let me put up again, let me first, let me see, lights, 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 lights. Let me first remind you of what the Hinnell map is. H of xy is equal to P of x minus ay x. And let me write the for formula for the inverse also. Now, the main thing that you need to realize in order to understand this the, the first thing to understand is that the Hinnell map looks like this. What that means is that if x is big and x is big as compared to y, then this is still true after applying the Hinnell map because the big term in here is this p of x which is making x a whole, the, the x coordinate a whole lot bigger. So if there's some region as soon x, as x is bigger than some number r, and x is bigger than the absolute value of y, there's a region which is mapped into itself. And that region I'm going to call V plus. The inverse of the map is almost the same except that the role of the two, of the, of the two variables is exchanged. As a result, if you, map, if you do the Hinnell map backwards, there's a region where y is big and y is big, big as compared to x, which is also mapped into itself by the inverse map. And all of the interesting dynamics is in the little square down here, about which I'm not going to be un unfortunately able to say much. Now, what does the region G plus equals R, uh, not R, uh, let me choose some other letter, um, A, and X inter V plus look like. My claim is that this is a solid torus, some big number. some big number, is a solid torus for A sufficiently large. And it's easy to see why if you think that G plus of XY is like log X. This says essentially that X is approximately log A, no uh, A, uh, e to the a, and y is less than or equal to x. If you believe that this is actually correct, then x lives in a circle and y lives in a disk, and uh, so it's a solid torus. So here's this solid torus. 
And proving that it really is a solid torus is saying something precise about the equivalence up there, which one does by a reasonably careful asymptotic development. Oh, I said. Is that better? Okay. So here is this, this, re, this solid torus. Well, I think I need to say a little bit more. In V plus, G plus has a harmonic conjugate. V limit This limit, which is intended to be just to be the, uh, if you take a logarithm of this, you get one or the limit of one over d to the nth times the logarithm of the Henault map. This limit exists in v plus. So in v plus. The, you really do have a harmonic conjugate. In this region, that region there, you really do have such a, con such a conjugate. And so this torus maps naturally to the circle. Which would do you take? Oh, well, if you really want me to make a development of this, I can. But the, uh, the key point is that every time you go one step further, there's one uh, there, there's, there's one root which is closer to the, uh, to, to, to the point that you left than the others. There's an intelligent, there's an intelligent best choice. So there is an intelligent way of taking There is an intelligent way of, say, uh, of, turning, of making sense out of that expression. So this, ma this torus maps to the circle by, let me give a name to this thing, phi plus of xy. So this maps to the circle by phi plus. This is really the circle of radius e to the a. Now, here there is the torus corresponding to e to the da with the same definition in here v plus. Of course, if a is big, e to the e, e, da is much bigger yet, and so we're just fine. And this maps to the circle also. And here you have the Henle map. The Henle map maps this torus inside this torus because V plus is mapped inside V plus. And this diagram, theta maps to d theta, commutes. So here you, down at the bottom, you have the circle wound around itself d times. And upstairs you have a torus which is mapping injectively into the image torus. So you think about it for a while and you see where the solenoid is about to, is about to appear. It has to map inside something like this. Okay, now what does this say about the foliation? Of course, in V plus, part of the leaves of the foliation are precisely the fibers of, v, of phi plus, since phi plus is precisely the, an analytic function whose real part, well, is actually logarithm of g plus, the logarithm of its real part is g plus, but still the fibers are the same. So here we can see the leaves of the foliation. It's the nicest possible foliation of a torus just by disks. Of course, this torus is also fibered by disks in exactly the same way by the foliation. And in particular, there are two little disks in the image 
which must correspond, well, two or more generally D. There are D disks in the image, which must come from D of the disks in the original torus. So, I will, th I will pretend that D is 2, but all of this goes through exactly in the way, same way when D is larger. These two pieces of leaves of the foliation are actually parts of the same leaf. In fact, their images are both inside here and outside here in the great outside world. What are we, are we seeing? We are seeing those two disks inside a bigger disk. The bigger disk is the inverse image by the Henault map of this disk. The inverse image is something out here with those two disks inside. Now, supposing I do the Henault map one more time. Well, here's the Henault map one more time. And this thing will now wind around in here d squared times, which a prior I should be 4. And there are four disks, which are all going to map into one disk like this, which means that if you extend this picture, well, you're going to see this picture again. And then all of this is going to be part of some bigger disk. This bigger disk is the inverse image by the Henault map of this disk over here. And I'm sure that everyone is capable of con con continuing this construction and seeing a, a union of, of Riemann surfaces, all isomorphic to disks, an increasing union. It actually does matter. Uh, and the answer is they turn and they all turn differently from each other. Uh, it depends in a delicate way. It, these disks, they aren't just any old disks. They live over the circle. Each one has an angle. And precisely how they turn within the next one all depend on which angle you're at and which half of which angle you're looking at and so forth. It's a complicated description, but not, not out of hand. Get this indefinite metric on the manifold, you know, with this mirror position and orientation changing. The Riemann surfaces. I'm not sure I understood your question. Yeah. When you have your positions, you know, with these similar surfaces. Yes. I mean, they can already be such a way that you know, I mean, the orientations can change. Right. So orientation. Mm. They'd have to have well. I mean, when you stack up, you know, when they stack up, I mean, suppose, you know, I mean, some of them can do some funny things, can't they? Well, yes. I mean, since they're isomorphic to C, they're canonically isomorphic to C. Except for, uh, they're, they're, except for, for one rotation's worth of po possible choices. So once you've chosen a direction in one of these disks, once you've chosen a direction, you can carry that direction around and it has to come back somehow to a direction over here. And then you can carry it around and it has to come back to a direction in there. And how all of these directions fit together is a complicated business. Uh, but actually, I'm going to describe it in a moment, so it's not all that complicated. I think, though, I answered your question. I'm not sure, but I hope so. Well, I think you have to use your own. So it looks like an affine like map from one more C to another. Yes. So that's why the location yes. Is well, if you have a map of C yeah. being mapped to another copy of C by an analytic map, you don't have an awful lot of choice. That's right. <laughs> By an isomorphism, there really, there really aren't so many. Now, you, still, this description would be perfectly compatible with the Riemann surface being isomorphic to a disk, but it's easy to bound the moduli of regions like this and to show that these moduli are actually growing so that this Riemann surface is, in fact, isomorphic to C. Now, where does, where does one leaf intersect this torus? Well, one leaf, let's start here, 
Next time, it goes in all the, d the angles that are off from the angle of by this, by 1 over d. A 1 over d, 2 over d, I'm counting in turns. And next time, all of those that are in 1 over d squared, and all of those which are in 1 over... So in the final analysis, all the leaves that are off by a dyadic angle from the one at which we started are all parts of the same leaf. They certainly are going to be dense in this torus. Okay, I've justified almost everything that's here. The only thing that I haven't justified is that each leaf is dense in a torus with a solenoid removed. Now that actually, I'm not going to be able to justify it rigorously, and the description that I'm going to give would be equally compatible with some other possibilities besides the true one. But this torus, one leaf is certainly going to be dense in this torus. It's also going to be dense in the inverse image of this torus. It's also going to be in dense in the inverse image of this torus by, uh, by the second iterate of the map. In other words, what I am saying is that the set of Z of XY such that G plus of XY is equal to log R, log A, is equal to a union of a torus A, union H inverse of a uh, torus at A to the D, union H to the minus 2 of a torus at a d squared, and so forth. And this is an increasing union of tori, each embedded in the next, and winding d times and times inside the next. So you have to take this torus, think of it as a little thin wiggly torus that winds around d times inside a bigger torus. Think of that as a little wiggly torus that winds around d times inside an even bigger torus, and so forth. Well, it's a little hard to imagine this increasing union, but here's a way of thinking about it. Look at this torus, but don't think about the one you're seeing. Think about the outside one. The outside of this torus is also a solid torus in S3. Now think about the outside of this one. This is another unknotted torus, so its outside is another solid torus, which the original one winds around in d times. You discover that it winds around d times by putting a string like this and then re pulling the little thin one uh, till it's round and discovering what happens to the little string and the answer is that the little string now looks like this. It does wind around two times. So you can think of such a union of tori as the outside of the biggest one, contained in the outside of the next one, contained in the outside of the next one, contained in the outside of the next one, and obviously the increasing union, if this is really the way they are situated, obviously the increasing union is the complement of a solenoid. So that gives some sort of a phony justification of this, uh, of this step. The phony is that you don't really know just how they're situated, and life is a little bit more complicated. Uh, as it turns out, if the inclusion of the torus into the torus were anything except exactly the right one, the manifold that you obtain by this construction is some manifold that is sufficiently uh, perverse that it is not an open subset of any compact manifold whatsoever. So it's easy by a construction which looks exactly like this to make genuinely nasty objects. So, what do you mean by uh, there is here 
I implicit in this, there is a map from a solid torus to a solid torus. This map can be conjugated to a map specifically of the form zeta z maps to zeta to the d zeta plus epsilon uh, z zeta to the k. Now, the zeta lives in the circle, the z lives in the disk, and this map winds the circle around itself d times and puts the disk into a little disk of radius epsilon centered around the point z itself and twisted by some angle zeta to the k. So here is the exact statement. If k is equal to 1 minus d, this construction genuinely does live, lead to the three sphere minus a solenoid and if it is any other number then this construction leads to a three dimensional manifold which is not an open subset of any compact manifold. Excuse me? This is, a, this is what I call a solenoidal mapping. I doubt I invented the name though. So here are some questions. Two questions specifically and both of them I think are of considerable importance. The first is I have a really good description of U plus. It's a quotient of C minus D bar cross C by a group. Uh, I un understand its topology, I understand its analytic structure and I have just as good a description for U minus but I don't have any sort of such a good description for the interaction of these two structures. More specifically, there's a locus which really deserves to be thought of what as... Does mean? Well, so U plus, uh, K plus lives up... K plus is sort of a vertical set the way I've normalized my, my Henault mappings. And K minus is sort of a horizontal set. And so the whole outside of K minus is U minus, the whole outside of K plus is U plus. And of course they have a great big gigantic interse intersection. And this intersection, which is a great big huge open set, contains two foliations which some places are tangent. And this locus of tangency is really what corresponds to the critical locus of the Hinnell map. What really should be thought of as the critical locus of the Hinnell map is the locus on which these two uh, foliations are tangent. That is a certain Riemann surface, presumably of infinite genus at least sometimes, sitting inside C2. Uh, it carries a positive harmonic function, so it's not isomorphic to C. Well, I guess it could have singularities. It's a complex curve. It's a complex curve conceivably with singularities. In fact, there certainly are values where it has double points. Trying to understand exactly what this curve and what its quotient by H is strikes me as, a, as an effective tool for trying to understand Hinnell mappings. What's H? That's the Hinnell mapping, which acts on X and which acts discontinuously on X. Now, the other question is, since we understand U plus so well, why can't we just go to the limit and understand the boundary of K plus by approaching it from the outside? How do the leaves behave as you approach, as you approach K plus? I'd like to make this question much more precise. And my much more precise is the following. I had said earlier that there exists an isomorphism of U tilde with C minus D bar cross C. The problem isn't so much that it exists, the problem is that there are far too many such isomorphisms. Uh, the group of automorphisms of C minus D bar cross C is a big infinite dimensional group and uh, one needs to choose a normalization. Is there an intelligent normalization? Is there a normalization specifically so that gamma extends to the circle cross C 
And so that the quotient of the circle cross C has something intelligent to do with the boundary of K plus. So what I am hoping is that there is an intelligent such normalization and that we will get statements like the following. That in the solenoidal case, in the case sense of, Smiley, of Bedford and Smiley, the group acts discontinuously on S1 cross C, uh, on S1 cross C, and that the quotient is precisely J plus. And then for other values of the parameters where you lose this solenoidal nature, then uh, there will be regions of discontinuity of this gamma, and that the, quo the quotient of the region of discontinuity by the group might be willing to be parts of J plus, with, of course, complications at the regions of discontinuity and so forth. So I think that if anybody can figure out what the intelligent normalization is here, uh, there will then begin to be a relation between the theory of discrete groups and the theory of Henle mappings, which might prove to be really fruitful. Can I go back to part one? Are you you're saying that you know that X is connected? I am not saying that I know that, a, that X is connected. Now, should I say it? There's a, there, that's a better question. Should I say it? I, I don't know, and I mean, I, I hesitate to even admit this, but uh, I do not know whether X over H is compact, and it should be obvious. And it's, how I could have thought about this and not know the answer to this is beyond me, but I don't. I, I, I was discussing it with Bedford just before the lecture, and I can't, I, I'm sh surely it must be compact. But if there's this compact Riemann surface, it has a genus, it's sitting around just waiting to be studied, and what have I been doing all these years anyway? Uh, it really makes you wonder. Are you studying the compact manifold? What? Say it again. Am I studying what on compact? Do you begin with the manifold? Is it compact? No, it's C2. Uh, I mean, no, I'm no, starting no, with... Those are the positions. I guess I don't know what you're asking me. Well, you, what, you, you study Riemann space, right? But you put you know, a Riemann space that you foliated. What's that? So I foliated a certain domain U plus in C2. Oh, okay. U plus is C2. Okay. In C2. Okay. The set of points which escaped to infinity under the iteration of the Henault mapping. Mm -hmm. I foliated that subset of C2. Oh, yeah, but it's no, it's certainly not compact. But the quotient of this X by the Henault mapping may well be a compact Riemann surface. I'm almost sure that it must be hyperbolic. But um, why don't you prove it for me? You, pr you prove it and, uh, uh, well, no, U plus. U plus is certainly not Kobayashi hyperbolic because there are all these copies of C in it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the balls are tubes. No, 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 but the point is that H is hyperbolic and induced, I mean, sorry, X is hyperbolic. Induced map on it satisfies Schwartz's lemma, so it's subtracting. Yeah. So the very strong conclusion that it's not just hyperbolic, but it's kills the dynamics. Well, 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 H is, H, is an automor H is an automorphism, whatever happens. H is an automorphism of this X, so that the issue doesn't come up. So this is a connectivity equation. So if you take a polynomial of one variable, yes. taking critical points, yes. and perturb it to become a Hanon map, yes. would this Riemann surface be disconnected? Uh, corresponding to the, to the I, think, I think all I have ever done carefully is to draw the trace of this in the real, which is already interesting, as it turns out. But uh, in R2, you can take a real Henault map, uh, which is a, a real horseshoe, and you can draw these foliations, and you can draw their locus of, ta of, tan of tangency. And if I, I should have a computer picture to show you of what it looks like. Is it correct to think about the, of the connected components of this Riemann surface as critical points? 
Uh, my belief is that actually the whole Riemann surface is connected. My belief is that the whole thing is connected. That there's only one branch that goes off to infinity. Yep, well, maybe. Okay, let me start now on my next example. Non-degenerate homogeneous mappings from C2 to C2. If you take two homogeneous polynomials of degree D and you d design these things so that uh, the inverse image of zero is just zero, nothing else, uh, so that then they define a, a map from the Riemann sphere to the Riemann sphere. Every line is taken to another line. And, of course, maps from the Riemann sphere to the Riemann sphere are what people in complex, anal in complex dynamics eat for breakfast. They, they have Julia sets, and these Julia sets have come to be sort of personal friends of, uh, of a large class of people. So we think, we think of this P, P bar here, as being some personal friend which we would like to relate to the strange world of two dimensions. So in this setting, the theorem says that again there is a Green's function. There is a function g sub p, which you get by iterating p to the, p to the nth of xy. Some points will go to infinity, some points will go to zero. And there is a function which measures how fast you are tending to zero or how fast you are tending to infinity. And I noticed that I forgot to write something which I should have written here, which is g sub p of lam lambda xy is equal to g sub p of xy plus log lambda to guarantee that this is really a one-dimensional uh, object, not really a two-dimensional object. So this limit exists. It's a, it's a straightforward argument. And uh, it's, it's a continuous uh, plurisubharmonic function except for its logarithmic pole at zero. And uh, it's harmonic except above the Julia set. So the Julia set is this complicated fractal subset of, of the sphere, possibly everything that happens sometimes. And what I, what I want to understand is how the inverse image of the complement of the Julia set is foliated by the Riemann surfaces that are guaranteed to exist by the existence of this harmonic function. So I hope that you will find the language pleasant. I will refer to the cone over a certain part of the, of the Riemann sphere for just the inverse image by the obvious projection. I somehow find that language of cones uh, pleasant. I don't know whether everyone will. What, what is the creation of the language? It is. It is non-singular. Ah, you figured it out. <laughs> now, there are other reasons than just intellectual, abstract intellectual interest for wanting to understand why this foliation, how this foliation is constructed, namely that the, analytical, the analytic continuation of the butcher coordinate is just another way of talking about the leaves of this foliation and I want to make it precise exactly how. So this concerns specifically the case where the map from P1 to P1 is simply a polynomial. Already the Julia sets of polynomials are perfectly interesting objects and uh, so I'm going to suppose that it's a polynomial. And if it is a polynomial, the 
one of the principal methods of study of polynomials has been If you have a polynomial, I will draw the generic polynomial z squared minus 1. There exists a map phi sub p defined actually in a neighborhood of infinity, and I'm going to go into more detail about this, which conjugates the dynamics outside of the Julia set to simply z gives z to the d on the outside of the unit disk. So that's what's written here. There exists a map from C in a neighborhood of infinity to C in a neighborhood of infinity, which conjugates the polynomial to simply Z gives Z to the D. Log phi is actually a globally defined pluri subharmonic function on the plane, which is harmonic on the outside of the Julia set. And now, this is not the nice case, but there are other cases. Let's consider, for instance, the polynomial z gives z squared plus 2. You will notice that the critical point in this case, 0 maps to 2, maps to 6, maps to something, and certainly escapes to infinity very rapidly. And if you take the circle of radius 2, its inverse image is a cardioid. The inverse image of that is some distorted cardioids. And everything that is not infinitely deep in these figure eights tends to infinity. And then the, the Julia set is just the Cantor set, which is down here infinitely deep. The critical point escapes to infinity. In this case, you can look at the level curve of the function g sub p going through the critical point, which will probably look very much like, but not quite be this figure 8. And the map phi sub p The map phi sub p will produce an isomorphism of the outside of the outside of the level curve going through the critical point onto the outside of the disk of some radius r, where r is precisely the supremum of the values of the green functions at the critical points. I've drawn here the case of, criti of quadratic polynomials where there's only one critical point. Now, this access to the critical point and this access become some access like this and some access like this. And the map cannot be continued beyond this line. You run into ambiguities. So let us call P sub P the inverse of phi sub P. Let's call T sub P the map like this. The map from the outside of the disk of radius R to the outside of this figure 8, whatever it is. So the point about this is that P sub P parametrizes the leaves of the foliation. The precise statement is for any non-zero complex number A, the ga map gamma sub A of zeta given by this formula, A C sub P of zeta over zeta and A over zeta, extended to infinity in the obvious way to go to A, parametrizes parts of the leaves of the foliation. And so understanding how the leaves of the foliation behave is essentially the same question as understanding the analytic continuation of Psi.
In this case, the theorem goes as follows. Well, there's an easy theorem and a hard theorem. In the case where k sub p is connected, then this parametrization which I had written, this one, is actually defined for zeta in the entire unit disk and just gives an isomorphism onto a leaf and, it, and therefore all the leaves are simply closed disks. All the leaves are closed disks and the set of leaves is parametrized by the non-zero complex numbers by the point where they intersect the x-axis. But, in the case where one critical point escapes, well actually I don't understand the general case where one critical point escapes. The only case I understand is when P is a quadratic polynomial where one critical point escapes. And when P is a quadratic polynomial of which one critical point escapes, then the leaves are all of infinite genus, dense in something which is a three-sphere minus a product of the Julia set cross the circle. And in a sense which I think my drawings are going to convince you of, are trying their very best to be Seifert manifolds of this circle cross a Cantor set, just as before in the case of the Hinnell maps, those surfaces were trying their very best to be Seifert manifolds of the solenoid at infinity. Of course, a solenoid isn't a curve. You can't actually have a Seifert manifold of it. And such a thing is not a cur curve either. It, can't, it doesn't have a Seifert, ma a Seifert manifold. But they're, these leaves, they're trying. So all that I really have time for is to give you a picture of how these things fit. So first of all, If I draw C2, that's C2 here. The level curves of G sub P break up C2 into regions which are all homeomorphic to closed balls, but whose boundary has a complicated geometry, uh, specifically the boundary is completely smooth because the function which is defining it is pluriharmonic except over the cone over the Julia set and on the cone over the Julia set this boundary has some fairly complicated structure the way I like to say it is that it has a Levy form which measures how bumpy it is and this Levy form is the pullback of the uh, Brolin measure so it's really carried on the inverse image of the Julia set now, the, uh, the leaves of the foliation are certainly going to stay within whatever three-sphere they're in, where three-sphere means level set of G. So at best, they're going, to be inside, they're going to be dense in something homeomorphic to a three-sphere. Now, this three-sphere maps to P1, and that this is the world's most standard topologist picture of the Hopf vibration. Uh, the, the whole three, this whole level set of G sub R maps to P1 so that all the inverse images of points are circles, and these circles are all unknotted and linked with linking number one. And in particular, in the case where the quadratic polynomial, uh, where, J, where the quadratic polynomial has a critical point which escapes to infinity, the Julia set is a Cantor set. I had sort of sketched it uh, the infinitely deep inside infinitely many figure eights. And the inverse image of this Cantor set in the three sphere is something which is a Cantor set cross a circle. Although you should, although it is in fact a Cantor set cross a circle since, so the, because the, the vibration is trivial over it. The so, trivial, vibration is trivial as soon as you've removed one point you still should think of it as kind of twisted. All the fibers are linked. Now, the inverse image... If I take 
the outside of a region like this. The outside of some disk which contains the entire Julia set is a disk. The inverse image of that disk is a torus. And I want to think temporarily of that torus as the outside of this torus. And I will draw one leaf of the foliation. One leaf of the foliation is drawn here. So the torus is here, half is in front of the board, half is behind of the board. And this part of the board, going out to infinity, is one leaf of the foliation on the outside of this torus. Now, let's consider two disks like this in P1 and their inverse images in this sphere. Well, that's two solid tori inside here, which link with linking number one, something like this. Did I get it right? Over, under. There, I got it right this time. What happens is that this leaf of the foliation on the, in the outside and this leaf of the foliation on the outside, which is another leaf, the leaves come out. Uh, the, I hope you can visualize them. I could draw, I could make a picture which Three minutes? Yes, certainly. You can imagine the foliation of the outside as gotten by rotating this circle around this axis. And then the leaves of your foliation are the, what you get by rotating this pattern of curves. And this leaf here is what you got by rotating this line. And the leaf on the outside is what you got by rotating this line. Now these two leaves are going to come together to be part of a single leaf. And that single leaf looks like this. But now you have to figure out about what's happening in there underneath where there's a twist. The standard twist of a piece of paper coming in and this thing here goes over there and fits onto there. OK, you can figure out that the genus has gone up by two. And now, if we continue putting two more curves, two more tori, two more uh, tori inside this and two more tori inside this, the genus grows by essentially a power of two each time you continue the construction. And of course, you have to have four more leaves, two more leaves, which are going to come in and fit on it to the one inside. So that in the final analysis, the leaves are all going to be dense and are going to be of infinite genus, trying hard. You can see them trying their very best to be Seifert, surf Seifert surfaces of the product of the Cantor set across the, across the circle, which is sitting infinitely deep inside all the tori. OK, well, I think I'll stop here. mentioned that maybe in, in these kind of dynamical systems, some of these domains might need to be exotic, different structures than our form. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So here is a question. Supposing you were not to look at the map x squared plus c y squared y squared, but you were to be so unwise as to add in an x cubed. <laughs> there still is a domain of attraction to 0. And the question is, what does this domain look like? Now, I'm probably insane to mention anything as a conjecture, so I'm not going to mention it as a conjecture. But I would not... Proposal, proposal. For a proposal. <laughs> for, all points, for all points C on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, this domain is, home, is homeomorphic to R4, and they are all differentiably different. Now, what grounds do I have for thinking that this might be true? When you, 
you study the complement of the Whitehead link, what you discover is there's a natural way of exhausting the complement of the Whitehead link. And at every finite stage, you've got lots of topology. But what happens is that the topology that you have so far dies when you go f a step further, but then a whole bunch more topology arrives. Then you go a step further and everything that you had dies, and in the limit everything dies, but as you're going along it gets worse and worse. <laughs> this is, this is, as, so I have tried to do that kind of construction on this three-dimensional manifold, which is also exhausted by functions, by the function g. Uh, the function g exists here also, you have to define it slightly differently, but y because the map is not homogeneous, but it still exists, actually you don't have to define it differently, it still exists. But now when you start running into the critical locus of this map, which no longer lines just on a cone, you create new topology, you can do Morse theory uh, on, on this thing, and you keep creating th topology. But what appears to happen is that as topology is created, well, the next topology that you see, at, at the same time as it creates a whole bunch more stuff, kills what you had before. And this seems to happen repeatedly. So, uh, there the really should be the c level of complication of the cone over the Whitehead, c Whitehead product. And as far as I was able to make up the Whitehead continuum, and as far as I was able to make up from reading Friedman and de Michelis, that was the kind of object which gave rise to different, uh, to, diff to the uncountably many different models of R4 which are sitting inside R4. And so I have sort of reasons. But does the topology of that picture vary as C varies? Absolutely. The, the, the order in which new critical levels arrive is, is I mean, I, I, it's the same asymptotically for values of C inside the same component of the Mandelbrot set. And then when you change from one component to the next, the asymptotics of how the critical points arrive change. Yeah. So, so, so that's my reason, such as it is, for thinking that there's a serious chance that this provides you with very simple examples of, uh, uh, of these uh, Donaldson, uh, Donaldson, Friedman, de Michelis fake R4s. But I, you know, my computations weren't rigorous even when I really had just done them. And I've, I've, it was a few years ago that I did them. I don't know once again, I mean, what have I been spending my time doing when I have this exciting thing to investigate? But I have been doing other things, what can I say? But it does strike me as something else that's really well worth investigating. Do you have a count for these you know, surfaces, you know, the number of collected surfaces that you have? I didn't understand the question. The number of, when you call it this map, you know, this thing, you get these three surfaces. Yes? You have a number, you count for them? Well, there are uncountably many, of course. That's what I thought. Yeah.